Greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We pray that this day finds you, your family, friends, and loved ones in good health. We are continuing our study on eschatology. Eschatology, as you know, is the study of what's going to be happening in the end time, what God has in store for the church and for all of the people on earth, and we will be continuing with that today. First, let us begin by going to the throne of grace in prayer. Lord God Almighty, our Heavenly Father and merciful Creator, we are so thankful that you've blessed us that we could come together today to continue studying your word. Thank you for giving us the understanding and the knowledge and inspiration as we move forward and growing in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We ask your blessings on this study here today, Lord, that you will help us to comprehend, help us to understand. We pray that you'll move me aside, yet use me as an instrument in your hands to bring your word to all of us, that all of us will learn and grow and benefit from what you're telling us here today. Bless the transmission, the audio, the video, and everything, Lord, and we just thank you for it all, that we can continue moving forward on this Christian journey. We just give you all honor, glory, and praise, and we commit this into your hands. In Jesus Christ's holy and sacred name we pray, and we say amen. So now then, we are uh, going through the timeline of future events. If you look at the schedule on your screen, you'll see that we had been going through several different uh, benchmarks there. And right now we are at the letter G, where we were talking about the white throne judgment last time. And uh, at this point in the timeline, the white throne judgment has is uh, all of the people from Adam to the end of the millennial who are not saved would have been judged and sent to the lake of fire. These are people that are not saved, so all of them will be going into hell fire. Also, Satan, death, and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. All evil has been put away at this point. Now God is preparing the heavens and the earth to move us into eternity. So we're going to start from there today, what he's doing to prepare us to move us into eternity. Now we're going to go through uh, five different areas, uh, subjects or subtopics where we want to cover what he's doing to prepare us. So the first one then is the purging or destruction of the present heaven and earth. And we're going to talk about that and make some comments. We look at the scripture for that. We went through the scripture before, but we want to include it again so that you could keep in mind the order of events that's going to be taking place. The second one is the creation of the new heaven and the new earth. And we will be making comments. I'll give you the scriptures on that and make some comments with that as well. And of course, the third one is the conditions of the new heaven and new earth and we'll make comments with that as well the fourth one we'll show the capital of the new heaven and new earth now we'll spend much more time on this one because we want to give you a description of how our heavenly home will be and uh, how it is the actual capital and we'll give you other information very helpful information on that as well and then we'll talk about who is going to be uh, in the new heaven and new earth. Who are the citizens of the new heaven and the new earth? So let's begin by looking at the first one there, and the purging or destruction of the present heaven and earth. And as I said, we went through the scripture before, but we want to do it again. So let's just read through it and see what we have here. And this is Peter. Peter is saying, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will pass away with a roar, the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be burned up. It's 2 Peter 3 and verse 10. So before God could set up the new heavens and the new earth, he is going to purge this earth and the heavens. Now there are three heavens mentioned in the Bible. In 2 uh, Corinthians in chapter 12, the Apostle Paul talked about the third heaven. So if there's a third heaven, we know that there has to be a first and second heaven. The first heaven, of course, is the atmosphere of the earth. That's where we see the birds flying and so forth. The second heaven is the stellar universe, the stellar heavens, where we see the sun, the moon, the stars, and whatnot. And the third heaven is the one that where God resides. This is where Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of the Father. So this is where God is uh, in this third heaven. 
Now, when we when Peter said that he, God is going to purge the heavens and the earth, he's not talking about the third heaven. When Adam and Eve sinned, or when Satan sinned, I should say, the earth was uh, corrupted right at that time. The heavens and the earth, uh, they were corrupted at that time. So God is going to be restoring them. But the third heaven was not corrupted. That's where God resigned. It's the first and second heaven and the earth itself that went into decay and corruption. As we read in Romans 8, it, the, it, the earth and, and the heavens are waiting for God to restore all things. And, uh, and this is where we are now at this point here. So that's the heavens and the earth. Uh, the first and the second heaven those are the ones that we are talking about here now well now when Peter said that uh, the heavens and the earth are going to be purged or burned up and dissolved there are different takes on this some theologians believe that this means God is going to destroy the entire earth and the heavens that's the first and second heaven and the heavens and he's going to recreate all over again and they have a very good view a very good argument for that because of this verse right here in second peter 3 and verse 10 and also we uh, read in isaiah chapter 65 god said i will uh create a new heaven and a new earth so that's another verse there's also in matthew 24 where jesus said um, that uh, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. But he said heaven and earth are going to pass away. So theologians believe, that is some of them believe that uh, God is going to destroy the earth, destroy the heavens, and create new heavens. At the same time, there are other theologians say, well, well wait a minute, uh, we don't believe that, we take it differently. What they believe is that uh, God is not going to completely destroy the heavens and the earth, but that God is going to renew, renew and restore the heavens and the earth. That is, he's going to purge the earth with fire and the heavens with fire and then renew and restore the heavens and the earth. And they have a very good argument because they too have scriptural references here. First of all, in Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, uh, we read that God has finished his creation and he rested which tells us that he's not going to do any more creating. So this is one of the verses that these theologians hang their hat on when they talk about this. Also, uh, in Revelation chapter 21, when it said new heaven, the word new comes from the Greek word kainos, K-A-I-N-O-S, which means not necessarily new in time, but new uh, uh, new constructively, renewed, it's going, uh, new in quality, qualitatively. So it means to restore and renew. So they believe that this is one of the reasons why um, that God is not going to destroy everything. Also we read in Ecclesiastes uh, where, Peter, uh, where King Solomon wrote that he said, uh, uh, a generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. That's Ecclesiastes 1 and verse 4. So they said, well, look, the earth is going to remain forever. So God is not going to just destroy the whole earth and start everything all new again. So uh, there, there are different takes on this, whether he's going to destroy the heavens and the earth and recreate all things, or whether he's just going to purge it with fire and, and restore and renew all things in this manner. But it doesn't really matter. We will have a new heaven and a new earth. This is nothing to be divided over. The church should never get divided over this. We should never get into heated debates and con debates are okay. But when you get into arguments with the downright, outright arguments, uh, then we know that we have to be a little bit careful of that because this is not an essential doctrine of the Christian faith. It's not something that we need to divide over. There are 14 essential doctrines of the Christian faith which we do not compromise on. We'll go through those when we get into some of our apologetic topics later on uh, in the year. Uh, but there are 14 doctrine of the essential, uh, essential doctrine of the Christian faith and we um, we, we, can, we don't argue, we can't argue over those. We do divide on those because uh, uh, these documents will determine, adherence to these documents will determine whether the church is a cult and it also determine whether a person is saved. Eight of the 14 will determine whether someone is saved or not. So that's different. But this here, whether God will 
destroy the whole earth or whether he will just renew and restore it. It's not an essential doctrine. Nothing to fight over and, get and divide over. So that's number one. Now let's go to the second one here, the creation of the new heaven and the new earth. Here, uh, this is uh, the Apostle John writing in the book of Revelation, Revelation 21. John said, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth, earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. No longer any sea. Right now, the sea and the oceans make up about almost 70, about three-fourths of the earth's surface. So we are very accustomed to that, but there's not going to be any more uh, sea. In, 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 there will be one river flowing out from the throne of God in the new heaven, in the new earth, or in the new Jerusalem, rather. There'll be one river flowing, and it will have waters of life. We'll say more about that in just a moment, but uh, how, the, how the new Jerusalem will be. Then John goes on. He said, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. He saw this new city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. And he, he described it as beautifully as he could. He, he said, uh, as a bride, beautifully dressed for, her, dressed for her husband. This is a very appropriate analysis that he's making, or metaphor that he is using, because a bride that's dressed for that wedding is is about as beautiful as she will ever be she will she will she, I can still see my wife today coming down the aisle with the father walking her down the aisle when we were getting married and that bride she was just as pretty flawless impeccably dressed everything was directly in place and when that bride walks into that church when she walks down that aisle every eye is on her the men are watching her, the women are watching her, the children are watching her, the preacher is watching her, everybody, the groom is watching her, of course, everybody is watching her. She's impeccably dressed, and she's simply beautiful. And this is how John is looking at the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. A beautiful thing. We'll talk more about it, how it will look in just a moment, but it's going to be simply beautiful. Then John goes on in describing, he said, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. Imagine that. God the Father coming down from heaven in this new city to live with us. Coming, you know, people, a lot of Christians say, Well, we're going to die, we're going to go to heaven, we're going to stay in heaven. Well, that's only temporary. Our ultimate goal is here on earth in the new city of Jerusalem. The new city. This is where we're going to be. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. That is this is fascinating to think about that. Here you got the creator, the holy, righteous, perfect, omnipotent, omniscient creator of the whole universe coming down to live with us. That is it's a, it's fascinating just to think about. It. It, it puts you in awe when you really think about God himself coming to live with us. They will be his people, talking about us and everybody else on earth. And God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away. He will wipe. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Everything's going to be perfect at that point. No more death, no more pain, no more crying, none of that. Everything is just perfect. Everybody is going to have the full joy. There's going to, some theologians describe it as, as the, a city of no more. This is actually heaven here on earth now. This is heaven. Okay, this is our heaven. This is where we're going to be living. And uh, it's going to be a, a, a city of no more. Let's just look at some of the things that will not be there. No more sea. We just talked about that a moment ago. Sometimes in the Bible and in ancient history, the sea is shown as uh, chaos and disorder. Uh, because the sea could get rough and it's killed millions of people over the centuries, perhaps even billions or multiple millions, but it's killed many. So there will be no more sea. That's gone. That's out. These are some of the things now that will not be there. No more tears. There's nothing to cry about. All the things that bring tears are gone away. They're going to be removed forever. No more tears at all. No more death. 
Because remember, at the great white throne judgment, death and Hades was thrown into the lake of fire. So there's no more death at all. That's gone. Nothing's going to die. Human beings are anything that has life. No more mournings. Nothing to mourn about. All sorrow is going to be comforted. Nothing to mourn about. Nothing. All of that's a thing of the past now. No more crying. No more tears. Because joy is going to be supreme. The whole city of Jerusalem is going, of the new Jerusalem is going to be a city of joy. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful time. No more pain. Because all the sicknesses and diseases are gone. That's going for good. You never have any more of those things. No pain at all. No more thirst. When we thirst, we desire for something. But the, all desires are going to be fulfilled. There's nothing to desire. We're not going to want anything. Anything we want, we'll have. And, uh, and, and we, or we're only going to want, want, want what is righteous anyway, what is good, because our desires will change. We will be glorified, perfect saints at that time. So we can't want for anything that's not good or pleasing to God. No more wickedness. All evil is going to be gone. All evil put away, banished forever for good. There'll be no more temple. We go to the temple now because we see the temple is the house of God, so we go there. But God, Jesus Christ, God the Father, is going to be right there with us all of the time in the new Jerusalem. The new city, he's going to be right there all of the time with us. So we got, there's no, there's no need for temple. He himself is the temple. We are the temple. We are there all of the time. There's no more night because the glory of God is going to keep everything illuminated. You don't need nighttime anymore. God created the night now so we could rest and sleep because he know, know that some of us will just keep, go out there and keep working and doing things we shouldn't be doing. So he made night for that man so man could go and sleep and rest because the body needs rest. Well, some of us still go out there at night and work like crazy and, and day too. No more closed gates. No need any gates, period. But we'll have gates, as we'll talk about in a moment, but they will not be closed. God's uh, doors always open. His throne and the Holy of Holies is always open to those who are priests and kings now. But later on, it will be open all of the time to everyone. No more curse. When, when, Adam and, when Satan sinned, the whole earth was cursed, the universe was cursed. But now Christ has removed that curse and that's, and that's the end of all curses. No more curse at all. So those are 12 things that will not be in the eternal state or in the new city. Uh, New, New Jerusalem. Those are things that will not be there. And I have some of the things that will be there, and these are just a few of them. Uh, the Holy City itself, the New Jerusalem. We just saw that John said so he saw it coming down out of heaven, the New Jerusalem. So we know that's going to be there. God Himself, we saw that in Revelation 21. God Himself is going to be living with us. He is going to be there, and it's going to be nothing there but righteousness. It is a city of righteousness. The whole city, this is what Peter said in 2 Peter 3.13, he describes it as a city of righteousness. Now, let's talk a little bit more about this city, because this is, this is something that's really fascinating here. The city itself. Uh, now... The, the New Jerusalem is actually heaven. It's the capital of heaven, okay? It's going to be the capital of heaven. It's going to be the beautiful, gigantic, humongous city. It's going to shape like a cube. That's that cube that you see in the lower right corner on the screen. This New Jerusalem is going to shape like this. This is the city. It's going to be 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles deep. This is how this new city is going to be. It's going to be something like, like you've never, ever seen before. What we tried to do was put an overlay of it on the United States. Since everyone is familiar with the map of the United States, we did an overlay of it to try to give you an idea of the size of this city, how big it's going to be. So let's just talk about that for a moment. If you look at, this, at your screen there, you will see that, um, if you look all the way to the upper left, you'll see that the that's in British Columbia, Canada, okay? And uh, then we go 1,500 miles over to the east, or to the right, if you want to say it that way. We go 1,500 miles, so we get all the way over to Ontario, Canada. Then we come south, or come down, 
all the way down right through uh, Missouri, Arkansas, all the way down into Louisiana, 1,500 miles. Then we go west or to the left. We go 1,500 miles all the way into northwest in Mexico. Then we go north again all the way up through California, Nevada, Oregon, Washington State, all the way back up to British Columbia. 1,500 miles in each direction, long, wide, and deep. That's how big this city is going to be. Now, this city laid over the United States like that covers over half of the United States. It covers all or part of 24 different states. Now, you may have visited some of these states, and these states have uh, lots of cities in them, small cities, large cities, and, and uh, you may have been to uh, Denver, Colorado, or Dallas, Texas, or some of the other cities in some of these states. Well, this New Jerusalem is a city itself. It doesn't just cover all of those cities. It covers the states themselves, 24 states. It covers over half of the United States. That's And by the way, this is just the ground floor. Now you got to go 1,500 miles straight up. This is how humongous, how gigantic, how big it is. In fact, it is so large, there have been some Christian mathematicians who did the geometrical calculations of it. So I want you to see exactly how big. This is our home now. This is where we're going to be living. So just take a look at how big this city is going to be. Look, let's see some of the calculations here. They, when they did the calculations, they said, they came up with these results, that this city is 3.375 billion, billion with a B, cubic feet of space. Covers over half the United States, as we said. There are over 792,000 floors with 250,905,600 mansions on each floor. So you got over 250 million mansions on each floor and you got 792,000 floors. So when you multiply that out, just look at this carefully now, you multiply that out, you will get 198,717,235,300,000 mansions. Do you get that? 198 trillion 717 billion 235 million 300,000 mansions. Remember what Jesus said in John 14. He said, In my father's house are many mansions. This is what Jesus is talking about. Over 198 trillion mansions. And guess what? Each mansion would could have 200 and 50,000 square feet. 250,000 square feet for over 198 trillion mansions. That means each one of us will have our own mansion. And by the way, that 250,000 square feet is almost six acres. That's almost six, that's 5.73 acres. So you got almost six acres here for each one of us to live within the city itself on these floors. This is something incredible. There's, by the way, this is our home. This is where we will live for the rest of eternity. It's the capital of heaven and the earth. This is what Jesus is talking about when he said, he has a place for us, I'm going to prepare a place for you. This is something phenomenal. It's, it's awestruck, it, 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 it's awe-inspiring, it's incredible. Now, if you want to see the details of the calculation, we put the link there so you can go to the website, JesusIsTheWay.com, and you can see how the mathematicians uh, broke down this calculation to come up with this. Now, that's 250,000 square feet for each one of us, which is almost six acres, but he actually, he could break it down to just three acres and, uh, and, and, and get that many more, get a whole lot more uh, people in there. But this is just... Uh, just to give you an idea of what we are talking about here. And as I said, you can look at those mansions and, and so forth. I'll just take one acre myself and I'll be quite happy, thank you. 
But the city itself now is going to be, uh, here's what, what John says about it. Just look at this for a moment. He's in, in, in Israel, this chapter 21. Now in the city, having the glory of God, her brilliance was like a very valuable stone, like a stone of crystal clear jasper. Now, it is brilliant shining in this brilliance. When he said jasper, jasper is not crystal clear. Jasper, jasper is a precious metal. The jasper that we know today is not crystal clear. It's opaque or cloudy like. It's not crystal clear. So if you take the Hebrew word or the, the Greek word for jasper, what it means is diamond, something similar to a diamond, which is crystal clear because it would be, have to be a very expensive diamond to be crystal clear. So it would be a crystal clear diamond instead of the jasper that we know of the day. It would be translucent, which means light could shine through it. So now you've got this huge, gigantic, humongous city with light shining through it. Uh, it was, the whole city itself brilliant John described it here he said it had a great and high wall with 12 gates now the wall itself would be 216 feet thick and 216 feet high with 12 gates by the way that's 72 yards that the, the wall itself is going to be 72 yards it's not going to go all the way up to 1500 miles but it's about 72 uh, yards high and uh, it has 12 gates at the gates 12 angels now the angels standing at each of these gates are not to protect anything because there's no evil or nothing bad the angels are just there for beauty for decoration and ceremonial purposes that's all the angels are there for they, you, know, you don't have to guard anything. In fact, you don't even need, need any locks or none of that kind of stuff. In the kingdom, in this new heavenly Jerusalem system, there's, there's not going to be any locksmith, no policeman, no army, navy, air force, marine. There's not going to be any doctors or no nurses or no hospitals. Don't need all that. All that stuff is a thing of the past. We are living in a new world now, the new Jerusalem. This is heaven we're talking about here now. So he had the gates, and the names were written on the, the twelve angels, and names were written on the gates, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel. Now this is significant, because the church has taught the day that God is finished with the Jewish people. That is a terrible mistake the church has made. And it, it hadn't just started recently, this goes all the way back to the time of Martin Luther. They talked about when uh, the God is finished with the Jewish people and the church took the place of the Jews. All of the promises that God made to the Jewish people are now made to the church. This is simply not true at all. In fact, we are going to go over a lesson where we're going to show you how and when and why God chose the Jewish people. Why the Jewish people are so important in the Bible. But here you see right there, their names are embedded emblazoned on the gates of the city this is permanent this what this is signifying is God's permanent covenant with the Jewish people this is why he put their names on the gate this will this new Jerusalem city is forever it's never going to go away this is permanent he has a permanent covenant with the Jewish people he's not gotten the root of the Jews and the church has not taken the place of the Jews verse 13 there were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. So this is uh, uh, how this, the new city is going to be with the new gates and so forth. Now, if you look at the scripture right under that in Revelation 21, 21, it talk about the gates. He said, and there were 12 gates. The gates themselves were made of 12 pearls. Isn't that amazing? Now, you've got 216 feet, that's uh, 72 yards going up for each gate, and each gate is a big, gigantic pearl. Can you imagine a pearl that big? And, and this, this is pure stuff here. This is not the kind of fake pearls or cheap pearls. This is pure, 100% pure, as pure as you can get. This is coming from God. This is what Jesus said he was going to prepare for us. This is what we will be seeing. But then it goes on. He said... And the, and the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl. 
Incredible. That's amazing. A single pearl. A big, gigantic, shining, shimmering pearl. Unbelievable. And the street of the city was pure gold. Pure gold like transparent glass. There's no such thing as pure gold today. You can't get pure gold today. The closest you could get to is about 99.9% .9 or something like that. But there's no pure gold at all. In fact, you can't even get to 99.9. .9. They say 99.9, .9, but we know that's not true. But you, you are, this is pure gold. Pure gold. And here's the thing about it. The gold is like transparent glass. How could you see through gold? See, God has such great abundance that he paved the street with gold. Incredible. He paved the street with gold, pure gold. And it's, it, it's like transparent glass. You can actually see through it. You know, people talk about the streets of gold when they get to heaven and so forth. There are no streets. It's just one street. One street. And that street is going to be made of gold. You only need one street because everybody's going to live on Main Street. That's where everybody's going to be living. How you get 198 trillion people living on Main Street? Well, that's God. We're talking about the creator of the universe. How he created the universe out of nothing. That answers that question. If he could do that, anything else is a piece of cake. Okay. Now, there are also 12 foundational stones. We didn't put the scripture here for it, but this is in Revelation 21, verse 19 and 20. Here are the stones. This is the foundation of the city now. You have Jasper. Now, we talked about Jasper before. Jasper is actually is talking about a diamond or a diamond-like precious metal. Emerald, he has chrysolite, chrysoprasus, sapphire, sardonic, beryl, jacinth, chalcedony, sardius, topaz, and amethyst. Those are uh, type stones to the, for the foundation that is going to be that he's going to have for us. Now, here's the thing about it: the names of the twelve apostles are embedded on each one of the stones and the foundation. The names of the 12 apostles, the 12 apostles are representing the church because the church was built on the, the prophets and the, pro the, pro the apostles and the prophets with Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone as Ephesians 2 and verse 20. So now he's got the church represented with 12 names of the apostles on each stone. He's got the Jewish people represented with the 12 names of the 12 tribes on each one of the gates. So he's permanently representing his, his covenant with the church and also with the Jewish people. They are two separate entities in God's sight. Two separate entities. The Jewish people did not take the place of the church. The church did not take the place of the Jewish people. Here they are both um, embedded on the new city Jerusalem. Permanently forever. This is forever. And this is where you and I are going to be living in this great beautiful city there's none like it imagine just living in the city all this the precious stones the foundation shining and glittering it's, it's, it's going to be so fascinating you'll be on a spiritual high just living in it all of the time you're feeling good all of the time you just think about the best feeling you ever had in your life and multiply that a couple of million times and then you might come close to what this is going to be like might come a little bit close to it. You get a slight taste of what it's going to be like. And by the way, this is for all eternity. Eternal pleasures. Pleasures all of the time. Psalm 16 and verse 11. So let's continue on here. There's also a tree of life. Now, this tree of life is very mysterious, but let's just read it and then I'll make some comments on that. And it showed me a river of the water of life. Clear as crystal coming from the throne of the God of God and of the Lamb in the middle of the street. On either side of the river was the tree of life bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now this tree of life, this is the same tree that was in the garden of Eden. You see, what happened was after Adam and Eve sinned, God blocked off this tree so nobody could get any access to it. Because if Adam and Eve had gotten access to the tree of life, they would have been forever living in a sinful condition with no way of redemption. Because they would have taken of the tree of life. But after Christ came, now God could bring the tree back and now they got the tree of life. But here's the amazing thing about this, this, uh, this 
this scripture here where it talks about the tree of life yielding its leaves. It says, On either side of the road was the tree of life bearing 12 fruits, 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Well, why would the nations need healing? And we already talked about in the new city, Jerusalem, there's not going to be any sicknesses, no death, no hurt, no pain, no suffering. None of what are they talking about here? Who is going to need healing? But Herod says that these uh, leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Well, here's what goes, what's going on here. You, you remember when we talked about that there were people coming out of the tribulation or everybody would be saved. They move into the millennial. There is a 1,000 year millennial period. Billions of babies are going to be born. Some of these children will grow up and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Some will not accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The ones that accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior will come out of the millennial into the eternal state. But they will not be glorified saints in this new Jerusalem, in this new Jerusalem city. They're going to make up the nations. These are regular human beings except they're now made perfect. But they, they will come to the city of Jerusalem to bring glory to God continuously. But they will not live in the new city like we are. These are the people that will make up all the nations on earth. In other words, these people are going to be like Adam and Eve were before Adam and Eve sinned. Before Adam and Eve sinned, they were human beings. But they were perfect human beings. They had no sin at all. Until Satan got to them, of course. But... This is how the people are going to be. So there will be people on the nations on the earth during this time. Except they're going to be righteous people. Now, I suspect that God will have us over these people because there will be billions of them. And uh, these people will make up the different cities or states and the nations itself. These people will come up to Jerusalem, the new city, bring their glory to God. In fact, you can read that in Revelation 21, verse 24 through 26. They tell, uh, where John talk about the people going to be coming up to the new city and uh, the glorify God, bringing their glory to God. So they're going to come up to the new city and bring and praise and worship God, but they'll be living on earth in the, in the, in the uh, various cities and states here on earth. This is how that's going to be. And these are the people that will need healing or they'll take up the tree. And also you'll notice the river of waters of life. They'll be able to drink of that water too. And this is what keep them perpetually healthy and going on. These are righteous people, perfect people, because when we get to the eternal state, there's not going to be any more evil or death or sickness or sin or none of that kind of stuff. Everything is gone. Everything is perfect from there on. So even though they're not glorified saints living in the city itself, the new Jerusalem, they will become, they'll have access to the city and they will be perfect people. So this is what John is talking about here. Fascinating. Now, who is going to be in the new city, the new heaven, and the new earth? Who is going to be there? When we go to Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews sort of summed it all up for us in this passage of Scripture right here. Here's what the writer of Hebrews tells us. He said, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the, new, of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. That's the new Jerusalem, the new city. To an innumerable company of angels, all right. That's one going to be there. To the General Assembly and the Church of the Firstborn. Uh-huh. Church is going to be there. That's the New Testament Church who are registered in heaven. To God, the Judge of all. That's God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. You're going to be there. God. To the spirits of just man made perfect. Well, now, we got all the other saints now from the Old Testament and all other ones who have accepted Jesus Christ, the rest of the people who weren't in the church, like the tribulation saints, for example. And to Jesus the mediator, which Jesus is mentioned again here, of the new covenant and to the blood of the sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. So then we sort of sum it up for you here. And here's who's going to be in the new heaven and new earth. God the Father, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, all of the righteous angels, the all of the church age believers, that's those that when Jesus started the church 2,000 years ago up to the time of the rapture, all of us are going to be there. And all of the people who have God from other ages, that's those who are in the, all of those in the Old Testament. By the way, there's a little bit of discrepancy whether the one in the Old Testament are going to be a part of the church at that time 
uh, whether they won't be, but all of those people will be there. Also, the righteous people um, who came out of the tribulation, that kind of thing, those will be there as well. Um, those people will be on earth, as we just talked about, but they, they won't have access to the new heaven. So all the people from all other ages of God, the children of God, will be there. This is who will be in the new heavens and the new earth. So now we can see there what, where we are. We are talking about from letter G. We're talking about what the heaven and earth is going to be like, the new heaven and new earth. We get into the eternal state. This is what we're talking about now. The next time, we, we receive and we've seen many, many questions about heaven. People all over the country, all over the world, really, have lots of questions about heaven. Even some people who are not Christians, people who are unchurched, have many questions about heaven. So in part two of this, the next time we meet, which will be the 24th, two weeks from today, God willing, we are going to spend the entire time answering questions that we receive uh, from different people or most of the most common questions, about 20, 24, 25, or whatever we can cover, will be at least 20 questions that we will answer. And um, the most common questions, such as questions like, is heaven a real place? Uh, what are we going to be doing in heaven for all eternity? Is heaven going to be boring? Can we have pets in heaven? That kind of thing. My pet dog is going to be there. As my, am I going to be married to my wife or husband in heaven? We're going to answer all of those questions. So we're going to spend the entire time just answering those questions. And that will be part two of what heaven will be like. So we hope that you'll be able to be with us and, uh, and you could uh, benefit from these studies. Right now, let us go before the throne of grace in prayer. Our Lord, our God, our Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you've brought us through this Bible study here today. Thank you for teaching us. We ask that you'll help us to take this knowledge and information and meditate on it and to share it with others. We ask that you'll help us to use this knowledge and information to be ready to give an answer for the hope that is within us and to do it with gentleness and respect. And we pray, Lord, that you will help us to use this to make us better prayer warriors, Lord, as we come before your throne in prayer, uh, asking to speed that day, Lord, thy kingdom come, when we can really have the new heaven and the new Jerusalem. And God the Father, you living with us here, Lord, with our Savior Jesus Christ. We so look forward to that time and when this will come about. So we just thank you now for this. We worship you. We love you. We give you all honor, glory, and praise. We do it all in the mighty name of Jesus. And we say amen. So then, we thank you very much for being with us today. And we look forward to seeing you again. We will continue to pray for you, your family, your friends, and loved ones. And uh, we ask that you will continue to pray also and keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. God bless. <laughs>